the CEO of Blazemeter, Jmeter Cloud. Uh, thank you for all co for coming here. It's very exciting uh, for me at least uh, to be here and to see you all. The idea about this meetup is to talk about uh, Jmeter in particular, but in general performance testing and application uh, performance testing. Um, where I'm coming from, Blazemeter, myself, my team, we are doing Jmeter, you know, morning to night for several years now. We have a lot of experience uh, and uh, we want to share this, I want to share this experience with you. And, and the idea is that I if you came here um, according to the call of the Jmeter meetup, so I'm guessing that you are interested uh, to learn about JMeter and about performance testing in general. And the idea is that you will leave here that you have knowledge of um, what are the challenges, what can you do uh, to meet these challenges, and, and how to do performance testing in a good way. Uh, I can tell you that uh, given a certain application, we can write the script, uh, script you know, for this application in a matter of either minutes or hours. Um, and it, it doesn't take like uh, uh, a long time or uh, a lot of education to get to this point. So I'll do my best to help you uh, uh, get there. Uh, with me uh, is um, one of basically Blazemeter customer, but a JMeter user that actually did what I see um, as one of the challenging uh, thing that uh, is out there, basically test a very high capacity Facebook, uh, very rich application. So both of us are here, and thank you, Mike. Well, I'm going to present him uh, to you um, soon uh, to help you, you know, get more information about JMeter. So, and this is, we have the slide deck, uh, and we're going to run through it, what I thought will be the best uh, uh, flow to get people also maybe non-experienced and also people that with some experience uh, in, into the depth of JMeter. So we have the slide deck, but for me this is an open discussion. Feel free to jump, to ask your question. Uh, we'll provide an answer for you. We're going to discuss basically we're going to introduce JMeter, um, what it is, what can you do with it, uh, what are the limitations uh, related to JMeter. Let me ask a question. Do you hear me okay? Yeah? Fine. Okay, we're going to present uh, the use case about the Facebook uh, extra large application. Um, we're actually going to do uh, a recording, if time permits, obviously, and, and you're interested. We're going to do a recording, parameterization, and running of a script. Okay, all that within a single uh, uh, session. Uh, I'm going to describe what I consider, from my experience, uh, uh, best practices using JMeter, and what is left for open discussion, and uh, whatever you find interesting, we'll be happy to, to double-click and, uh, uh, and, and follow up on. So, can I ask can I ask you guys who raise your hand who used JMeter in the past? Okay, good. Who considers himself as an expert using JMeter? Good. So you'll help me. You, you better come here. <laughs> okay. So I, I'm running through this slide because most of you raised your hand. Okay, but I guess some of you uh, are new. So JMeter is basically an Apache project, okay? Why does it matter? Why it is important? Because Apache, basically the internet, you say internet, you say Apache, okay? This means that every protocol that, uh, you know, that runs in the Apache um, community of projects finds its way into, um, uh, into JMeter. So if you need, uh, I don't know, a web service of some sort, it's probably there. Okay, or an email protocol, or uh, I don't know, an SMTP protocol, SNMP protocol, whatever, it's probably there. Furthermore, the JMeter 
in the past was one of the, I don't know, projects of a project of Apache, meaning there was like Apache, there was Jakarta, and there was JMeter. Okay, and this was the weight that it actually got. Recently, it went up. So JMeter became an Apache project, okay? And more developers are developing JMeter. More users are using uh, JMeter. The number of releases, you know, if you use JMeter like four years ago, you know, the protocol coverage and its stability and stuff like that was in question. But today, like, I don't know, uh, in, in one year there was 2.4, 2.5, two, two versions, and 2.6. Okay, and, and each version obviously uh, presented uh, uh, different capabilities and, uh, and stuff like this. So it's, it's part of Apache. Uh, you have a comprehensive protocol coverage and scripting capabilities, as opposed to many other soft uh, testing application. Um, Eighty percent of what you need you can accomplish with a GUI, with a simple GUI. Okay, you don't need a scripting language to do. 80% of what you need. Um, and in terms of scripting, you know, all the things that you can think of, like uh, if statement, while statement, loops, random, parameterization, and, and other stuff that I, I'm guessing because such a large community is backing this project, any use case that comes to mind probably uh, has an answer uh, within JMeter. With JMeter, you can do, you can uh, build test script that are realistically that are realistic and accurate. Meaning, because you have a scripting language and, and a very good uh, um, uh, GUI to build. This script, you can build a scenario exactly according to, to what you need. Okay. Um, that's it. That's uh, that's JMeter. Okay. So nice tool. You download it. Uh, you learn how to use it. What can you do with it? So obviously, we talked about the comprehensive scripting. You can script any sort, not any, but uh, many of or most of the scenarios that you can think of. Uh, you have a graphical user interface with uh, scripting languages, support, for example, JavaScript, uh, BSH, and Java, and, and you know, so whatever you cannot achieve using the, the normal GUI, you can code. Okay? Talking from experience, Maybe I use some JavaScript, uh, you know, to do some uh, sort of mathematical uh, uh, thing, but that's it. Most of, of the stuff can be achieved using the, the graphical UI. Scalable load testing. With, with JMeter, you can test, uh, you know, hundreds and thousands of concurrent users and that, you know, generate the, the realistic traffic. Uh, platform agnostic, meaning there, there's a misconception about JMeter. Many people think that JMeter is for Java application. Th this, I don't know where it's coming from. Maybe, maybe something in the past. Uh, maybe it's the J. Yeah, maybe it's the J, uh, seriously. But because the idea is that you build a scenario. For example, let's take uh, uh, you have like a Microsoft IES, you have Apache and PHP, you have a Mr. Facebook application. Uh, you have whatever you want. You build a scenario to simulate the traffic that goes against this server, and that's it. So there, there is no limitation as long as it's, uh, I would say, web, but it's not only web, because JMIT also supports uh, database, um, various database uh, protocols. Um, it also actually supports TCP and other sorts of protocol. But what I'm saying is that uh, it doesn't matter what system you are actually testing. Um, you're probably, if it's like a, an out, um, a standard protocol, 
JMeter will probably provide you with a solution for that. I, I'm using the word probably and most and stuff because there is no 100% solution, but I would say that this is the most robust um, testing tool. Parameter extraction, my favorite. Uh, you need it, and, 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 and uh, JMeter provides it. Meaning when, how many of you um, know HTTP? Almost all. Okay. Um, okay. For example, you do a post with HTTP. Posting a form with HTTP. Usually, you would need to move a parameter from uh, the GET request to the POST request. Now, I'm checking you out to see if I'm going too technical. Okay? You need to extract this parameter, whether it's the token ID, the form build ID, uh, I don't know. So you need to extract it from one end and deliver it to the other end, to the second uh, request. JMeter provides this. Okay, you need uh, uh, to extract the session ID, okay, of a user that logs in, in order to attach it to the uh, additional request, to the the, the next requ uh, request. JMIT provides this, and it provides many ways to extract these parameters, whether it's a regular expression kind of uh, query, or an X path kind of query. So there are numerous ways to, uh, to say, okay, this was my last request. Now I need this parameter, this parameter, and that parameter in order to continue. Okay, JMeter provides this. Assertions, meaning the ability to say uh, if a request succeeded or failed. Obviously, there is like uh, not found or connection timeout. Th these are the objective failed criteria, but... I did the login, and the login wasn't successful. Okay? This is obviously a failed transaction. But the HTTP is 200, the HTTP code, you know, coming back. So I need to do an assertion, uh, to implement an assertion saying basically, okay, uh, I did a login, I was not able to log in, I got uh, your password is not good, the username is not good, so I need to do an assertion to catch these words saying the login was not successful in order to say this had failed, okay? And so much more, okay? This is uh, basically JMeter, um, what you can do with it. Any questions so far? Let's try it out. Yeah. You can mention some David. large company success story who used JMeter seriously for something. Google. Okay. Uh, I don't have a list on top of my... Uh, you you want to know big companies that use JMeter? I can tell you Citibank, Toyota, Second Market, uh, BBC, um, home else, and a lot more. Th these are big companies. Okay. You buy some other commercial product, you want to use like an open source or something else. My experience was it's it's really good for let's say uh, web services <coughs> testing, but once you go to UI, it's very difficult to uh, do significant load tests, and that's probably what I appreciate. And at the same time, yeah, all these commercial tools for UI. So expensive, prohibitively expensive. So I keep looking back at the. <laughs> no, actually, this is a good point. I think this is the next slide. Uh, what are okay. the JMeter limitations? Oh, sorry. Okay, you you mentioned UI. I'm to, I, I'm thinking JavaScript and and browsers. So, okay, JMeter is a load testing tool. Okay, and we can talk about Selenium, we can talk about Load Runner, we can talk about many uh, sorts of application. So each has its good uh, and, and it's, it's bad. Uh, JMeter is not a browser, okay, for one. Uh, you go to the JMeter website, it says JMeter is not a browser and it, ca 
it does not support JavaScript. So your immediate response is, okay, but I have JavaScript. You know, which website uh, does not include JavaScript? But I can tell you that 85%, 90% of the website can be tested by JMeter. So there is like a contradiction here. Okay? So right, JMeter does not run the JavaScript code that is found within um, the page. But if you ask like all the JMeter, you know, contributor and committer, what, what about this? They will tell you, okay, you're doing load, you don't need to do JavaScript. Okay, for example, I, I'm going to discuss this, but I if you're going to talk about JMeter limitations, it's not, a br it's not a browser, it doesn't support JavaScript. Uh, out of the box, uh, Ajax and uh, complicated framework also ha uh, have their limitation. In terms of capacity, the JMeter formal number is do not run more than 300 threads per engine. Okay? So we say that as well. Do not run 300 threads per server. But you can do more, but it's up, it's up to you. In general, JMeter scalability, it's up to you. For example, if you do a simple script, you know, I, you know, uh, um, one request, one request, that's it. No, no, uh, no mathematics, no calculation, nothing, that's it. It's a simple script you probably can do with low bandwidth. You can do a lot more than 300. But if you do a lot of calculations, okay, and JMeter enables you to do a lot of con uh, calculations, and with large bandwidth uh, requests, and with listeners, I'm going to discuss what listeners are. Okay, open. Maybe you can do only 100 threads per engine. Some of you are asking, what is a thread? So a, a thread is, is similar to a virtual user that runs in parallel. Yeah. The JMeter architecture in general, uh, multiple threads are running in parallel and are independent. So each thread is a user. It's executing a script, the script can control a certain thread or in general. For example, I have a CSV file with user and password, user and password, etc. And I want each thread to go through this file, you know, log in with name number one, log in with name number two, each different thread to run this CSV. Or I want in each and every thread to take a certain line of this file, but you know, I want this to be divided equally between all threads. So the JMeter architecture, multiple threads running in parallel, and you have the ability to control either them uh, to control them uniquely or shared. Okay, but in general, the, the 300 thread is is a good number to remember. A major limitation is. When you run a simple console of JMeter, like up to, I don't know, 200 users in parallel, you don't need, this line will mean nothing to you. But when you're running a larger load, JMeter architecture is a such that everything go through a single console. So the scalability of JMeter is, is limited. It's scalable, but the scalability is limited. Okay? This is a more advanced topic, so I'll leave it at, at this point, but this is a limitation. It's a memory consuming beast. Don't, m many prob people either love JMeter or hate JMeter. They will hate JMeter because the core dumps, okay, and something goes wrong anywhere, usually because of memory issues, okay, because it keeps, uh, JMeter keeps everything in memory. It's very easy for it to, to, to get overflowed with memory. And if it's a, a, you know, a distributed architecture kind of test, one of the engine will die. Yes? Does JMeter use out of heap memory all, or is it all inside of the heap? JMeter, you, you have the, the ability to, with the JVM uh, command line, uh, to set the minimum and the maximum. OK? And that's it. Once you reach the maximum, and you need more, it dumps its core. 
Um, okay, limited reporting capabilities under heavy load. Um, in general, JMeter inherent reporting is not that high, but there are plugins, various sorts of plugins. There are the JMeter plugin, BlazeMeter also has a plugin that provides uh, better reporting than what available uh, within JMeter. But don't expect much from the reporting, uh, especially under um, a heavy load. And scale with caution. As I mentioned earlier, uh, JMeter is scalable, but uh, you need to scale you know, with caution. Why? Because it's very easy. I, I give this example a lot. Take your home or your office PC and type 1,000, 10,000 users for JMeter. It, it will run, you know, but you will not get 10,000 users. Okay, because a single uh, PC cannot generate this kind of load, and you will not know it. And you can also, you know, take 20 servers, run a distributed architecture, and think that it is running. It, it also, there are lots of challenges there that needs to be managed right. Um, with JMeter, you need to scale uh, with cautious, meaning you and you need to know what you're doing um, in terms of configuration for the scalability to actually uh, perform right. Okay? Question? Yeah. Ken? Yeah, I think it's great that you're actually running this class because almost nobody would do this with the software. But uh, I mean, I can tell you that I mean, I follow like, the Giraffe project and, and Malibu and, and a couple other types of projects under a Yeah. So I think that, and I've seen this with other open source before too, so I think that that's a normal issue uh, with open source software at different periods of its, of its maturation is that you have memory problems, you have crashing problems, and, and, and then there's a point where it's mature enough that it's relatively stable. Yeah, and you can compare it, for example, for to other tools. So Such as is going to be one thread per four. Exactly. So. Exactly. So, so let me try to relate to both of, of what you said. First, you're definitely right, um, Ken. Um, again, I, I use JMeter 2.2 my first time, and now it's 2.6. I can tell you from my experience, JMeter is much more stable today like, you know, it's a totally different story than what it was in the past. Yet, it's still an open source uh, software. It's an amazing software, okay? It has its faults and limitations. If you know them and you accept them, this, is, this will be one of, you know, the best, except JMeter limitations, you know how to use it. Meaning, don't expect it like, uh, I, we, we talk with many uh, JMeter users, and you know, it's a, they try to test their script with 300 threads per uh, engine, okay? And everyone says it's okay, 300, it, it, here. So wh why? Because the script is too complicated, it's too intense, okay? So it, but if you know that in mind, and you know that you need to do some sort of tuning for your script, then, you, then you'll be okay. You'll find the right point where, okay, I need more engines now, okay? Or, you know, let, let's not, let's decomplicate. Let's not have the script so complicated. Okay, so if you accept these limitations and know them and, and follow the guidelines, you get an amazing software which is free of charge, okay? Supported by a very large community, okay? And actually can help you. Okay. Now, now you talked about David. You talked about Selenium. Okay, Selenium uh, does JavaScript. Uh, who asked about you? Did right? You told about JavaScript. It's not scalable. The scripting it's amazing software. Okay, uh, but it, it's more about functional testing than load testing. With load testing, 
again, it's better that uh, you know you downgrade your expectations. It won't be perfect, uh, you know, but it will test your server under load. Okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. Let's take a smartphone. Okay, I don't know, Apple, Android, whatever. It's a computer with a different user agent. Okay, and uh, if you're running a web or you're running a web service. Okay, so any sort of uh, this kind of application, you, you can do with JMeter. You change the user agent, okay, and uh, you, you can record it, you can parameter it, you can do, you can treat it the same way you do an application, you know, a web, a normal uh, PC or uh, whatever application. So, I mean, the recording is, uh, do they have a certain way you can copy your smartphone to your PC and then try to identify and record it or like some other means? It, uh, I, I'm actually going to show a recording process. But all you need to find is how to set this to use a proxy, and that's about it. Okay. Okay. At one point in time, uh, I get a call saying, "Listen, we are in trouble." Okay. Someone going to use our uh, 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 infrastructure, Blaze Meter infrastructure, with 110 servers. Okay. Dedicated servers, strong servers, all generating, you know, traffic. Um, so I'm very happy to introduce to you Mike Valenti. Valenti which is the cause for this uh, trouble. Uh, he's going to discuss uh, the use case of basically testing a very large, very rich uh, application using uh, the Hi. Um, Mike Valenti. I'm the uh, technical director at uh, Double Jump Games. Uh, we're a, a startup game studio in San Diego. And uh, about a month ago, I was doing some uh, uh, large-scale load tests on a new Facebook game. Uh, we were uh, using BlazeMeter to run JMeter on uh, 100 servers and generate load of uh, or simulate 30,000 concurrent users. Um, sorry. Uh, this is one of our, our graphs from, uh, from our load test where... Uh, this was uh, 18,000 concurrent users and uh, response times in the uh, uh, sub 1,000 milliseconds. So it was, it was okay, part of the way there. Um, so what I want to talk about is, is the goals of, uh, of large-scale load testing, which is uh, maybe a little different than, than normal load testing where you're looking at uh, CPU, memory, maybe doing some uh, query profiling and, and trying to get a basic idea of how your app is uh, performing under load. When you get up to uh, the, the much larger capacity, there's a, there's another um, another layer of things of uh, another element to it that uh, things that creep into it um, that can cause problems. Uh, so, for example, disk I/O connections, bandwidth, and and locking things that maybe don't show up when you're doing smaller scale load tests. But as you as you ramp things up, um, the physical uh, architecture starts to play a role, and, and you'll see things uh, in there that will. No, no, no. Okay. No, actually, I'm fascinated. Fascinated. I was fascinated in the past, and I'm still today uh, about his application. These are very important aspects. Not too many of us are actually aware. How many people are using Amazon here, web services? It's always the same uh, hands. Uh, who who is not using Amazon? Okay, uh, Donald. Donald, what are you using? We're using AP Cloud Services. The OpenStack one, the the new one. Yeah. Cool, but but what you, did you do week b before that? Oh, I was HP, so I don't know. So it's you. We use HP Cloud Services. Okay, that's interesting. So I will want. We didn't use that at all. I'm going to raise a few issues about this, and I will want you to comment on them. And another person that is not using Amazon. So not me, I tell 
Okay, let, let me ask the question about Amazon, and then I would love to hear other feedback. Uh, from the guys that use Amazon, can you tell me, please, what is the bandwidth allocation that Amazon provides per medium-sized server? No one, huh? Okay. Can you tell me about the OpenStack? <coughs> two cores, I don't know, uh, two, two gigabytes of memory kind of server. Well, I think throughout Amazon, they actually did study of this. And uh, they have enough capacity, really, to put a lot of stuff. Even if there are chatty neighbors, like uh, Netflix, for example, with their streaming video, you don't want to be to the server next to them. But still, if you, the, the problem with Amazon, what you want to do if you really, after kind of high capacity instance, you need to take the largest one, so you know that you occupy the whole piece of hardware. And that really... Uh, but you do, you do not provide me an answer. And, and this is not surprising. Who wrote software six years ago? Other than myself. Six years, no one? Okay, again, don't know. Uh, did you know your ser you use server like real iron, right? Yeah. Did you know what the bandwidth was there? Yeah, um, yeah obviously, right? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. I, I, or that, or use a different card, whatever. Okay, the I.O. Anyone knows what the I.O. Uh, of Amazon? You do? No, the guy no. Yeah, just some system I.O. So yeah, yeah. About 30 megs second, that's where they cut off from my experience. Who? We, which which uh, size of instance? Which size of instance? Um, I think that's the uh, extra large M1 or M2. How many using extra large here? What was that? Uh, no. Uh, You're doing everything extra large. It's... Uh, no, how many people are using extra large servers? Uh, I don't know, but I know I am. <laughs> okay, so you're the second one, the third one. Okay, basically what I'm saying is, I, I think that once upon a time, you know, uh, we knew everything there is to know about our infrastructure. Today, you know nothing, and I can tell you. Let me ask you: Who are you, uh, from the Amazon guys uh, and girls? Uh, who are using small and medium size servers? instances so basically the rest are using uh, large and extra large right okay Th the thing is that each image you get has different IO uh, capabilities different bandwidth capabilities obviously different uh, uh, CPU power and stuff like that but this you know because you, uh, the vendors publish the, the amount of cores uh, or uh, whatever, computing unit, and, and the memory. But you have no idea about these. Okay, and th this is why I stopped you, because th this is very important. So, for example, when you do like, a, when you deploy a system, you must know this. Okay, and you must be able to test to know what's right for, uh, for you. Okay? These numbers weren't published, and it was it was hard to find answers. And um, <clears throat> this was a, a, a greenfield stack all the way up. Uh, so we really needed to invest uh, effort in doing um, our due diligence with testing and make sure that all the elements of of the system were uh, working the way that we expected them to. And just just to to disk IO is the one of the most important thing you have for an application. If you have like a database in it or something like that, you know, bad IO performance, you know, bad application performance. And not, not all of the time you know where it's coming from. So uh, issues with, with large-scale testing. Um, so right away, one of them is access to a test lab where you can actually run your load test on uh, hardware that looks anything like production hardware. At a previous company that I was at, um, in our production uh, environment, we had you know, mirrored SQL servers with Fusion IO cards. Everything was great. And then our, in our lab, we were working with a single SQL server on regular disks shared with other teams. So we couldn't even run load tests uh, during the day because we'd be impacting other 
their teams. Uh, a lot of times the networks were, or, or just the servers themselves are works of art that you know, people have kind of cobbled together over time and, and uh, not really a great way to, to reproduce that in a, in a lab. Uh, at that same company with the, uh, the Fusion IO cards in, in production, we had uh, an F5 that was, that was doing uh, the SSL termination on the F5 and then in our lab, uh, we couldn't have uh, that same equipment, so we'd set up HA proxy and, and try to get as close as we could to it. But uh, it's much different than, than the real deal. Um, so large-scale testing becomes difficult because what exactly are you testing at that point? You can test functionality, but you're not going to really see how your app's going to uh, perform for real. So uh, obviously this is where uh, cloud services are, are a huge advantage. Um, we kind of already went through and talked about you know who's using what. It sounds like everybody is on uh, on Amazon pretty much if you're or HP, Verizon. Um, so double jumper running on uh, Amazon. Also, we're using Elastic Beanstalk. Have any of you guys heard of Elastic Beanstalk? It's a uh, it's it's one of their newer offerings. It's uh, it's an auto scaling layer that um, is on top of EC2. It's a management layer. Um, so we still have uh, full access to the instances that um, are running underneath Elastic Beanstalk. We can SSH into them. We can run custom images if we like. Um, but it's a layer that takes care of, uh, gives us a, a deployment pipeline. Um, and it's got a slick feature for doing zero downtime deployments. And we're also using some of the other services, uh, like Cloud Front, which is their CDN, and uh, Elastic Cache, which is a memcache service. Um, or a de deployment pipeline. Uh, Anybody familiar with the book Continuous Delivery? Uh, I gave a guy, uh, Jez Humble, he's uh, somebody out of ThoughtWorks. So, uh, I read that book about a year ago, um, and it was, it was really influential. It has, uh, it's all about a, a, a deployment pipeline and confident, repeatable uh, deployment. So, uh, working on a, on a greenfield stack, I wanted to incorporate as many of those uh, ideas as I could into into our system. And one of the important elements in that is that you take uh, binary. So in our in our case, um, we check in code, that code, uh, build a war file, and then we use uh, the uh, Amazon API to push that into Elastic Beanstalk into a test environment. And then from that test environment, we can promote to uh, QA, to load test, and eventually into production. So that, that ability to take the exact binaries and promote those binaries um, into different environments and having those environments be identical uh, is a really big deal. Um, and it was, it was such a big deal that we actually made that a requirement that we would find a software stack that, we, that could run inside of Elastic Beanstalk. And, uh, uh, that wasn't too bad. It was um, uh, the the play framework, um, which is a Java framework. It's kind of a lightweight um, framework. It's a bit clo as close as you're going to get to Django or Rails in uh, in Java, uh, and it's it's easy to expose uh, RESTful web services. Um, they did about uh, a month or so ago announce support for PHP. And then actually this morning they announced support for uh, for .NET as well on Elastic Beanstalk. But <clears throat> and then uh, on the back end we're uh, giving MongoDB a shot. Um, so the uh, <coughs> well, there somebody gets out here. Uh, the the dream was that uh, we'd have a fully elastic stack and. Uh, um, run a couple of, of shards running um, MongoDB, and then as we would dial up load, uh, we could basically just introduce another shard, and then MongoDB would um, do its magic to uh, distribute the, the data in its auto sharding, and, and then uh, everything would be great. Um, it wasn't quite that smooth, but, but, but overall things uh, went pretty well. Uh, some of the lessons learned. Anybody, anybody here use MongoDB? Um, Facebook. Uh, they were using Cassandra, I believe. Cassandra. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, so the, the dirty little secret of MongoDB is that it has a global write lock. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Web scale. Uh, <laughs> which, which is, is uh, mind blowing. Um, so that was kind of one of the things we battled with most and, and you know, where BlazeMeter uh, really came in handy is we'd dial, dial up these tests and, and uh, kind of tweak the sharding. So uh, sharding was a way to work around the global write lock. So we basically take a partition of data and that gives us, you know, if we have four shards, that's essentially four write locks. And for a Facebook game, that was, that was the bottleneck. And that's just due to the nature of, of, uh, of that kind of um, software where pretty much every user interaction is causing a write. Um, you know, there's some progress bar going up or some, you know, something's going up or down, or we're, we're capturing a bunch of user input on uh, pretty much every, every request, which is, you know, different than uh, something like, um, you know, WebMD or wellness.com that's, that's using, uh, that's, that's mostly like read heavy. Um, another case for sharding MongoDB is if you had just, uh, you were collecting tons and tons of data and you needed that to be available quickly, you'd shard to essentially get more memory. Um, but for us, it was all about uh, write concurrency. Uh, and it was painful. Um, we actually ran into an issue with, uh, with their routers where we would dial up these load tests to about 14 servers and then everything would look great and we'd, we'd push it up a little bit and it would just, it would die. And uh, we found out that the routers were flooding the uh, MongoDs with connections. And so we had to uh, go back to an earlier um, version of the routers and then everything was good. So it's, it's things like this that you don't, you don't know we're out there uh, until you, you kind of crank things up a little bit. Um, also, we learned about uh, uh, the collection size, number of collections, and document size, you know, how to, how to kind of fine tune things and, and uh, figure out what is, you know, with a, with a NoSQL database, it, the, the question is, well, how much data do I stuff into one document versus break that out into multiple documents? And uh, there's trade-offs there either way. Um, if uh, for us uh, writing was our issue, so if we split our data into too many documents, then um, when a, a user action happened, we'd have to write out to multiple documents, and then that would effectively hurt us with the uh, the write lock. Uh, so doing the uh, doing the load test was a, was a was a good way to uh, fine tune that and just find out where the uh, the heavy spot was. <clears throat> Okay. Okay, I need to start from scratch. Oh. You gotta start with All right, my name is Mike Valenti, and uh, <laughs> Are you saying it was the application deployed in the cloud? On on uh, on EC2 on BlazeMeter, so I would upload the JMeter scripts to the BlazeMeter service, and uh, and then just you know basically move a slider over as far as I could <laughs> to uh, to run the load test. Um, through MongoStat and and other uh, other other tools. Okay. So. Uh, uh, I was working with uh, Mongo HQ, which is a, a vendor that does uh, Mongo management. On they run on EC2, and, and uh, so they were a big help in, in uh, configuring the sharding and, and helping to dial in everything and deal with the routers and all of the all the little gotchas. If you knew about this huge list of issues, would you still have gone with Mongo? <laughs> well, you see the last one. It's really fast and it works pretty well. So <laughs> uh, overall, I'm pretty happy with it. Any any piece of software is gonna, it's it's got uh, it's dirty se little secrets and and you're gonna hate certain things about it. Um, I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's there's things like Couchbase, which uh, I, I think would get much higher write concurrency, but then there aren't uh, you know the, the community's not as good. There aren't companies like Mongo HQ out there that uh, can take on a lot of the the burden of you know with helping. Um, Get some verification. They don't have any way to get the data. Basically, if you lose maybe a bunch of 
basis, everything is gone. Uh, they, they don't have any inbuilt mechanism to kind of uh, recover anything. So they constantly making a multiple locations you have to keep back of the data. Right. If something goes offline or whatever. I mean, they don't have any like software wise, but you have to do something beyond that uh, outside of software. Yeah, well, it, it, we use uh, sharded replica sets. So, so uh, we use the replica sets to make sure that the data gets written into, into multiple locations. It's it's not transactional. Um, you know, we're not getting a guarantee that uh, the data is making it to disk and that it's written and that the OS said, yeah, it's on my disk and everything's good. Um, but it's a Facebook game. So, so we're, we're okay with that. Um, sure. Uh, just on number three, you know, Not as of about a month ago. Uh, we were using the latest router, and we were having that trouble, and, and we, we dialed it back a little bit. Uh, so uh, not, not that I know of. But there's, there's, uh, it's very active. Uh, Ten gens behind it. They're, they're constantly releasing um, patches and you know, moving forward. There's more choices now. Uh, DynamoDB's out there. Uh, Right, uh, and Couchbase, which I mentioned. Which is, uh, uh, okay, so building realistic test data, that's kind of a big deal. Uh, if you have an existing applica application, you can uh, just copy the data, maybe sanitize the, the user information and go with that. Um, but for us, we're, you know, it's a project. We had no um, data to, uh, to steal, basically, so we, we had to build it ourselves. and. Uh, one of the things that I thought was uh, was was valuable and that, that hopefully would be a takeaway from this uh, was to keep that simple um, and don't build a console app to build up all your test data or try to get it all to CSV and, and do some some big imports. Um, data models are a moving target. Uh, that apps can evolve over time. Um, the data can be very complicated and. Uh, trying to manage all of that externally, I think, is is, is trouble. So, uh, what we did is we uh, just have an endpoint. PLT was just the performance load test, and C was to see the database with one user. So, we issue a POST request to that endpoint, and there's this random player generator that is this uh, accepts that request and allows each subsystem to build up the whatever relevant test data it needs. So in a Facebook game, that's obviously like the basic player profile information. And then there's things like inventory, materials, uh, neighbors, pending invitations, wh whatever it is that uh, all of the, the uh, systems involved in the game, they know what data is important to them, and they can all uh, build up the data to complete that, that full um, data set for that user. Because it's important to find problems, you need to have um, realistic data to to really see what what's going on. Uh, and then this is just a it's just an endpoint. You can hit it with a post request from from whatever you want. So a great way to do that is then to use JMeter and upload that script to BlazeMeter, and I could I uh, was able to uh, you know spin that up on have essentially a, a, a thousand users creating every. Uh, uh, Couple seconds, and, and you know, I'd, several times I've built up to about 10 million test users, and uh, and using BlazeMeter was uh, was really cool. To, so hopefully that'll be a, something you can walk away with from this. Um, and then just to kind of extend on that, uh, once the data's in there, then actually writing the tests, uh, keeping things simple. Um, so for us, the, this is a Facebook game, which means it's a Flash client. And the, the back end is just uh, RESTful Web Services, which are, are super easy to consume from uh, JMeter. Um, again, though, there was the issue of uh, how to get a test user. So uh, you mentioned uh, use a CSV that has username and password and, and, and go through that. And that's, that's uh, a good way to do certain use cases for the large scale capacity test, that's uh, going to be problematic. You, you know, we can't have a, uh, a CSV with, um, you know, whatever many, you know, million users or 50,000 users and, and deal with 100 machines working off the same CSV and not having collisions or uh, whatever it is. So 
um, well, what we chose to do was to build the testability into the application and, again, have another endpoint where um, it's just a simple uh, get and it would find a random player and log that player in and um, send that back out to, to uh, JMeter and then we'd go and walk through a game loop and perform all the game actions uh, with that one test user that was issued out by the application. And so that makes things very simple for us to distribute then at that point. So we can, um, that, that was how we were able to get up to 100 servers and run uh, one session with uh, 60 and another session with 40 and I'll have to deal with um, just weird data collisions and, and whatever it is. So it's, uh, you know, this is kind of along the lines of, of, of DevOps where, you know, you blur the lines of, of in this case, it's, you know, with testing with development be able to kind of blur those lines a little bit and, and, and adjust the application where, uh, where you need to. Um, but I, I think it's important to, you know, at the end of the day, the asset that you want to end up with is not a gnarly JMeter script. The thing you want to end up with is, a, is an application that's easy to test. And, you know, that gets checked into source control. That's, that's the thing that's, the, that's hopefully um, of value at the end of the day. And, and JMeter is really a tool that is great at driving concurrency and, and collecting data about the, um, that concurrency. And BlazeMeter is a great way to, to distribute that and report that information. Um, but the testability stays within the application. So that was, that's kind of uh, my uh, nuggets for uh, my experience doing large-scale load testing. And I'll leave you with this. Um, I I created the users beforehand uh, because that was the the prof that was what we were trying to simulate was um, in our case was a million daily active users. We were actually under contract with our distributor to uh, to be able to um, to have our system perform at uh, sub 200 milliseconds at that uh, that kind of concurrency. And um, so for a Facebook game, that's mostly. It's it's a poor, it's it's some new users, but it's mostly returning users. So it, it wouldn't be an accurate test to try and create all of those um, as the load test. So we created the users in advance and then used those users, uh, pulled them out of a test pool basically. So every time JMeter would hit the app, there was a pool of test users that would get pulled out and and uh, and used for the the test. So your load test it was it was identical. So we used uh, Elastic Beanstalk, which is uh, an Amazon service, and um, that was one of the, the huge benefits. Was that that the I mean, identical all the way up from the you know load balancers to the instances, uh, same binaries. Uh, was. Um, I definitely invested some effort into try to make that very low overhead because uh, I, you know, I didn't want to introduce, you know, do the, uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle here. <laughs> uh, so uh, what I did there was um, when the server would start up, um, it would go and register itself. Uh, so I had, in this case, I was running about 20 servers at once on, on Elastic Beanstalk to handle the load of the 100 that the 100 JMeter servers were generating. And so when each server would start up, it would go register itself and then pull back a batch of test users. And it would hold them in memory. It would just, it would just hold the, the, the ID of the user in, in, a, in a big, uh, um, yeah, essentially. And so then each time it would ask for a random user, it would just um, give the next one walk through this array. And, um, that was, that was about it. And what else? Any other questions? Thank you, Mike. Um, actually, the one thing that Mike didn't show is the application itself. Uh, again, 
from experience with load testing, and I'm sure that everyone will agree here, you know, we are all afraid from a rich, first from a rich application, okay, I think David uh, mentioned this, uh, and then the capacity itself. So uh, from, from between the line, what I heard, and also from initial discussion, Basically, what Mike said, okay, it's a rich application, it's a large capacity test, but he made it simple. So he, he was able to do a lot of stuff w without actually investing a lot of time re-engineering everything. And for him, he, he got the result. He was able to test, he was able probably to fix issues that, that he, he found, uh, etc. So, and, and I'm guessing you have more... What I suggest now, if it's okay with you, let's do like 10-15 uh, um, minutes recess. There are pizza and beers and uh, drinks, and we'll reconvene and go deep dive in, into into <coughs> the meter. <coughs>